Morris, a little child, crawled into a crack that led to a dead end in 1965. 44 years later, the same events happened again. Both of these accidents had the same cause, with medical student John Jones getting stuck upside down inside a small passageway that led nowhere. The men committed the same crucial mistake in each instance. They entered the unknown cave by crawling in headfirst. Perhaps exploring underground caves with feet first could have avoided these kinds of incidents. Here at Processify, we share the thrilling tale of Neil Moss, a 20-year-old who dived feet first into a pitch black chokehold shaft. Nevertheless, the result was not what was expected. Neil's adventure took a terrifying turn when he got caught in Astley 8 covers, including Oscar Hackett. Neil Moss, a 20-year-old philosophy student at Bow College, Oxford, set out on a daring expedition into Peak Cavern, a renowned cave overlooking Castleton in Derbyshire, England. The group entered an uncharted tunnel, and with every hour that went by, rescue teams battled against the oppressive darkness and viscous mud, leaving an indicative historical reminder of the inherent dangers lurking beneath the Earth's surface. Known for his love of exploration, he was guided by British Speleological Association members. Part of the thrill of the venture, their objective was to explore a passageway about 0.5 miles from the cave entrance, testing the limits of the established system and looking into a fissure found in a side chamber two weeks earlier. Getting to the cave presented its own set of difficulties as they descended approximately 1,000 feet below the surface through a network of hidden caves. Once inside, they were met with the amazing mucky duck section. Navigating through a narrow, wet squeeze tunnel that frequently filled after rain with water, this made the boulder passage a somewhat simpler segment, although it still required them to navigate a number of uneven obstacles. About 150 meters into the route, they had to climb three meters up the north wall of the upper gallery, which was located high above a steep, muddy scree. The next hurdle was Pickering Passage, an extended tight crawl that required a combination of kneeling and F-length maneuvering. It finished with an awkward bend and a muddy sump above the eye hole that was just big enough to fit a human body. The tunnel ends in one of the most brilliantly painted stalagmite chambers in the chambers, currently referred to as Moss Chamber, past a muddy pool as deep as a thigh. Neil knew the chamber and the mysterious tight shaft very well. That had already been found, he couldn't contain his excitement to see the amazing room and investigate the fissure as the crew entered the cave. It required more than an hour of hard pushing, crawling, and climbing. This wasn't your typical excursion, it was an adventurous one. The group eagerly approached the fissure in the ground. The entrance to the fuhr was large enough for an average person to pass through, measuring about one meter by 70 centimeters. After reaching the designated chamber, which required significant energy and effort and required walking around for a while, they marveled at the natural beauty surrounding them. Neil was captivated by what was on the other side of the corridor, since no one had gone all the way down the shaft, but they calculated that it was about 40 feet deep. The shaft hung slightly off vertical for 12 feet. Then there was a difficult corkscrew twist that led to a bedding plane that was 10 tons long and inclined, and at around 3.30 p.m. there was another vertical drop of 18 tons. A flexible sided ladder, which is utilized to access tight spaces and challenging to reach places, was lowered by the group. Moss started to descend into the unknown, sliding and twisting as he went. There was no bay to hold him down because it was thought that the fish's narrowness would stop him from slipping. Soon after starting his fall, he came to an extremely narrow cramped and constricted screw type compression. Despite the difficulties, he was able to get through them with a sense of accomplishment. However, he was unaware of what lay ahead of him as he descended. Throughout his descent, he kept in constant contact with the team, reassuring them that everything was going as planned. After gaining access to the remaining portion of the shaft, Moss started to descend. As he did so, he started to feel irregularities in his footing. At first, he might have thought he could get around them, just like he had in the corkscrew section, but after making several attempts to move forward, he finally realized that a boulder was in the way and that he couldn't dislodge the boulder and maneuver within the confined space. He chose the tough course of action to go back up, but unfortunately, Moss discovered himself, despite their efforts to lift Neil a few feet by pulling on the ladder, it became jammed between the cave surface in Moss's body. His cries for help echoed from the depths of the hole as he found himself trapped unable to move in either direction. 
Difficulties like these are common in caving, and at first, Moss's companions assumed that rescue would be a simple matter of lowering ropes and pulling him to safety. But, when he was unable to lift his feet sufficiently to climb the ladder, he became sandwiched in an elliptical crevice only 18 in wide. However, they quickly understood how terrible the situation was. To aid in his recovery, a thin hand line was dropped, but multiple. The fact that each rope used to try to pull Moss up with the ropes broke or sheared on the rock edge likely caused him to become panicked. As he tried to climb higher, he became firmly stuck just below the corkscrew, unable to bend his legs to grip the ladder or flex his elbows to ascend further. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, some of the cavers left to seek more assistance, but within hours, volunteers from all over England descended upon Peak Cavern, motivated by a common goal of releasing the trapped Neil. Hundreds of volunteers came together to participate, with help from the Royal Air Force Police and even the Navy. The rescue operations only a few hours following Neil's imprisonment. When Moss's body shut off the air supply, the environment in the shaft became extremely contaminated. The rescuers faced another unanticipated challenge, and this time, his confusion and increasingly illogical actions were apparent. Witnesses reported him as less cooperative, acting as though he didn't care about how bad things were for him. He even made suggestions to other cavers to go grab something to eat. Experienced cavers were sent down the shaft to reach Neil Moss, but the poisonous air pulled them back one by one. After trying the descent, three of the volunteers lost consciousness. Ultimately, when the fourth volunteer, Ron Peters, succeeded in securing a rope around Moss's chest, they began to pull, only to find that this made his breathing problems worse. The news of his predicament quickly spread through the surrounding villages, and experienced carvers, who were known for their bravery and resourcefulness, hurried to Peak Cavern. Equipped with ropes, oxygen masks, and makeshift stretchers, they were determined to negotiate the deadly shaft. But the descent proved to be extremely difficult. The cramped passage, barely wider than a shoulder, twisted and turned, causing claustrophobia. The air tainted with Neil's exhalations assaulted their lungs and blocked their vision. One by one, they emerged defeated, gasping for fresh air, their eyes red and painful. Specialized equipment and oxygen cylinders were transported to the location by the Royal Air Force when, at 12.30 a.m., an oxygen tank delivery arrived. It was hoped that it would help Moss survive and make his rescue easier. But even though the air quality improved a little bit, it was still not enough. So they decided to keep pumping oxygen throughout the night, planning to send in a skilled caver who could navigate the narrow shaft first thing in the morning. Early the next day, June Bailey, 18, showed up, determined to go down into the depths. She suggested breaking Moss's collarbones if needed to free his shoulders and make enough room to pull him out. However, the toxic vapors limited even the famed Bailey's and other volunteers' attempts, forcing them to retreat by early Monday afternoon. It had been almost 24 hours since Moss had entered the cave, and despite the dire circumstances, the team was determined to persevere. Compressed air cylinders were used in an effort to remove the foul air from the shaft. The walls, ladder, and rope were covered in mud, making it impossible to locate Moss. All that was visible was a muddy blockage far below, with Moss imprisoned in an immovable position and one arm forced into a recess beneath a ladder rung in a futile attempt to escape. Meanwhile, as a precaution, the unceasing rain threatened to flood Peak Cavern's Mucky Ducks region. As a precaution, it was suggested that everyone leave the area with an RAF immediately, the rain stopped. They went back to the head of the shaft where they had last heard Moss breathing when the doctor joined the rescue effort, but this time there was no sound. On Tuesday, March 24th, 1959, Neil Moss was pronounced dead. According to Dr. Hugh Kidd, this was the first and only occasion in his career that he had done so without ever having seen the patient. Eric Moss, the father of the deceased, was waiting at the tunnel's entrance. He was the one who asked for his son's remains to be left in situ before anybody else put their lives at danger. Lives in opposition to public perception. The once beautifully decorated chamber that held the tiny shaft eventually became Neil Moss's final resting place. The story of Neil Moss captured attention throughout the world, making headlines and newspapers. The lower part of the shaft was sealed with loose rocks collected from the chamber floor, not with concrete, as was often reported. 
Today, the stalagmite chamber is referred to the Moss Chamber in America, Australia, and the UK in remembrance of the courageous young cavalier who unfortunately lost his life.